Dr. Tigo, life is simple. Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. Here on The Point of View, we get the right guests. We ask them the relevant questions on issues that matter to you, and you usefully, usually get some useful insights. Well, today we have a special show because as we count down to election 2020, we'll be speaking to some key people who are trying to enter parliament. This, our guest, is a huge figure in the Volta region. We'll talk to him when we come back. Stay with us. I just sent you a hotel to go money from my new number. We delivered two healthy kids last night. Congrats. Have you heard? Kwesi has two kids. Have you heard? My son has two kids. How was he? No, 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 no. No, your sister almost stabbed me. Have you heard the news about the missing ticket? Have you heard? Get free calls and free Airtel Tigo money transfers for six months on new Airtel Tigo Sims. Get a SIM. So welcome back to The Point of View. If you're watching on television, join us with your thoughts on the WhatsApp number on the screen. And if you're watching on any of our social media platforms, let's have a conversation. Let's hear from you in the uh, stream that's down there. Let's keep it clean. All right. So our guest today is the current minister for energy in the Akufuado government. He's also aspiring to be a member of parliament and for the people of Hohwe in the Volta region. And he happens to be Honorable John Peter Ameo. He's affectionately called John Pierre. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Is that your yeah. school nickname, John Pierre? <laughs> well, my good friend, uh, uh, Anjido. Koku Anjido. Koku, he calls yeah. you John Pierre. He calls me John Pierre. Is yeah. Koku now in the MPP or still in NDC? Oh, well, he's a Ghanaian. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think he's still in the NDC. He's still an NDC me yeah, member. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, welcome. How are you doing? Well, I'm very fine. Good. And I'm extremely fine, yeah. How are you combining energy ministry with campaigning for parliament? Yeah, it's quite an interesting and uh, but it's, it's, it's very hectic. Mm. Uh, as a minister responsible for energy, you know, you have uh, quite a lot of things to do, especially when the president directs that the lights must be on 100% all the time. Mm. Uh, so it tells you that you have to be uh, upcoming and alert mm. on your normal duties. So mm. it's quite a hectic job. Uh, but because uh, we've done this uh, for uh, some number of period for now, uh, we're getting used to it and mm. it's becoming a bit... You, you've had an uh, interesting transition because w in the media we got to know you as co-founder of ASEP. Precisely. And then you were, I think, head of research at some point before you became executive director. Director of research. Director yeah. of research. Yeah. Was that all part of a plan to enter politics? Uh, not at all. Um, uh, ASEP, you know, uh, was... Uh, formed uh, around 2011, mm. uh, 2010, by myself and my good friend, Dr. Amin. Uh, prior to that, we were uh, both uh, uh, chief executives under the uh, government of His Excellency, uh, John Ajekum Kufo. Okay. I was then the mayor at Hohe, okay. and uh, Amin was the mayor then at uh, Tamale. Tamale. Mm. So we worked very closely. So we has some element of uh, politics, you know, we uh, have tasted politics uh, before we left for school and came back and formed uh, SF. So mm. SF uh, actually was not just a stepping stone into politics, but SF was uh, rather to, you know, see how we can use uh, civil society mm. institutions, you know, to buttress and add value to government mm. policies. So that was directly what SF uh, seek to do. Mm. Interesting. So it's been, this is your third year as a minister, fourth year, fourth year, because I said minister for lands. Pre precisely, I minister see. for lands. And, and then you moved in 2018, 2018 yeah. to minister for energy. Yeah. Wow. What happened to the Galamse fight? Well, the um, Galamse fight is still ongoing. Is uh, it? You recollect uh, the president 
uh, put a team together, you know, interministerial committee. Mm. And, uh, and, and so they are still working. They put really? in a regulatory framework. Uh, what they try to do is to expand the framework of Galamsey to what they call the community mm -hmm. uh, mining. Uh, so um, they uh, uh, streamline, you know, that, that's the word I'll use under the, the, the Galamsey operation. So um, what we used to see where people just go onto the, the lands, uh, excavate and look for uh, minerals, you know, uh, it's not as intense as uh, we have now. Uh, some lands have already been uh, um, uh, exploration has taken place before they even hand it over to the community mining, you know, people. So mm. it's, it's, it's an ongoing. But th there's a, a view that fight has failed. No, there are reports we get on our show not daily at all. Not that at all. people are still doing galamse, and we are told that these excavators had been redistributed to party. No, no, no. I, I, I don't That's think, the report I, I we don't get. Think it's right. You know, the the Galamse, the commencement of this Galamse, uh, it's in decades, twenty mm -hmm. years there and about, and uh, it takes time gradually. You know, when something becomes very uh, well planted and to uproot it, you need to go around in in a nice way. So this is exactly what this government is doing. So it doesn't fail. Uh, the process to reform it, you know, and make it more appealing mm. for the purpose of sustainable mining is exactly what the government is doing. Mm. So it, I don't think it has failed. You, that, some people think with your movement from the ministry, the momentum eased. Not at all. You see, one thing people don't understand is how Nana Kufaru runs his government. No single minister can claim a credit for his ministry. And that I can really? tell you. Yeah, even me as an energy minister, you see the lights, you know, on. I, I can't take a credit for it. People may think because I'm the energy minister. Decisions are taken collectively as government. That is how His Excellency runs his government. Mm. So though I am out of the mining sector, I still contribute largely. And any decision that will come as a policy decision, mm. <coughs> sorry, or anything that will have an impact on the larger community, <coughs> His Excellency look at the government of the MPP. So it, no single minister, I'm telling you, mm. that is how the government of the MPP But had you run. finished your work before you were moved, or you were sent to energy to save the situation? Well, um, the processes that took me to the, the energy ministry, I think you are, you are all aware. Mm. Uh, the work that I was expected to complete at the last ministry before being moved to energy mm -hmm. ministry, uh, that, you know, had also been contributed mm -hmm. to uh, my you know, successor. You understand what I mean? So it doesn't mean that I moved from the uh, lands ministry and I've taken everything away, uh, away from that ministry. Mm. That is not how it works. You know, we contribute mm. to whatever happens. The, the big story when you were uh, moved to the energy ministry was the Ameri deal. In opposition, your side had said the deal was bloated by $150 million. You did a whole committee when you came into power to try and review the deal. Your predecessor sent the deal to parliament. Initially, the president signed, and then they re you reviewed the deal and brought a new one. Why did you bring a new deal? What was the problem with the initial deal your predecessor sent to parliament? Well, because we tried to improve of any negotiation. And, and so what we brought to parliament was an improvement uh, of what the existing one was. And of course, the current uh, Ameri deal, as it is now, is uh, far improved than what was signed by the NDC. They themselves know, you know, uh, we, we went to a very thorough uh, form of negotiation, you know, with the owners of the plant. And I think we've done a quite a good job. Really? And that is why the government... So how much it. money did you save us? You said that there was a $150 million ripoff. This was what your side said. Precisely. So, it, and the deal at the time was valued at $510 million. Precisely. So if, if, if it's a $150 million ripoff, it means that if you bring it back, it's going around three hundred and maybe $90 million. So... Did you save us $150 million when you renegotiated the deal? Well, it depends on how you looked at it. Uh, we have saved quite you know, um, a chunk of money in terms of the, the value in the range of about $60 million. That, for sure, we can see. The other one that you're talking about depends on the, uh, the availability of the plant. If the plant, of course, is not available, okay, that extra cost, you may not be incurring it. But what we try to do is to say that whether it is available or not available, we've taken it out. Okay, but if you read it into its availability, 
Now, of course, the plant is not going to be available 100% all the time. Then, of course, you may not necessarily be saving that 150 million. But 60 million, as I'm telling you, about 60 million, that money. Of course, but you need to admit it. then that the 150 claim you made was not correct. Oh, it, no, because it's, it's, it's an inbuilt. The 150 million, it's an inbuilt. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, inbuilt with the expectation that the plant is going to be available 100% all the time. Mm -hmm. If you happen to be available 100% all the time, you incur that cost. So what's the difference in this new deal? Yeah, because the difference now is that that 150 totally has been taken out now, okay? But you only price it because of its availability, that if the plant may not be available 100% all the time. Because if it's going to be available 100% all the time, that 150 becomes cost, mm. and it's built into the contract, mm -hmm. okay? But during the operation, what happens is that the availability may not be 100%. So you may not actually be incurring the 150, which is right, okay? But why do you put it into the contract even from the beginning? So what we try to do is to take that element out, which of course is a credit to this government. Really? Yeah. The other deal you criticized was the early power deal. I remember in uh, the time you were in opposition, it was said that Mahama had signed the $953 million early power agreement. Your deputy minister now, at the time he was an opposition uh, member of parliament, he said that deal was not good. But again, in 2017, when you, the deal came to parliament, you even granted tax waivers up to 19 million. What well, did you do to change the early power deal? You see, the early power deal currently is even under renegotiation. What you may not understand is the fact that all the PPAs and then the emergency power, power agreements mm -hmm. that were signed, uh, strongly we were the view that the tariffs, you know, for this power purchase agreement were quite high. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, uh, it's such that they were signed with, a, in, with, with the in quotation that whether the plant is deployed or harvested into the grid or not, you still have to pay it, which they call take or pay. Mm -hmm. Okay? Take or pay might not necessarily translate to 100% of availability of the plant. Mm -hmm. But what it means is that if you are deploying 50% of a plant, the mm -hmm. other 50% that may not be deployed for obvious reasons. Maybe because the, the, the volume risk, which in terms of fuel is on government, if government takes that volume risk, you may not be able to deploy the other 50%. You still have to pay mm. for the capacity charge. Okay. And we came out and said, no, all over the world, in a capacity short regime, mm -hmm. where demand far you know, exceeds supply, mm. you could be looking for power plants in that type of nature within an uncompetitive environment. Mm. Don't forget those plants that were... Uh, procure, they were procured without competition. They were done through negotiation. Okay. Now, when you have excess supply over demand, there is no way to give pay for plants that are, of course, not going to be available because already the, the supply exceeds the demand. Mm. So whether you like it or not, some plant, of course, will be unavailable mm. because demand is already been satisfied. Mm. The question is, why, therefore, do you grant those power plants knowing extremely well you have excess supply? Why do you therefore grant them an extra charge to say that even if you are not harvested into the grid, we will still pay you? Some people this felt that they... it was demand planning, that if the economy is going to grow by the levels that we expect the economy to grow, the demand for power is going to go higher. Precisely. Because that was what caused Dumuso in the first place. No. Demand was higher than supply. No, no, precisely. That is good. Demand planning. Demand planning must be done with regards to your annual growth. Mm -hmm. That is how it works. Our annual growth in Ghana is about 200 megawatts. It takes about three years, maybe maximum, two and a half years to complete a power plant. So you don't wait for demand to outstrip supply before you start construction of a power plant. Mm -hmm. If your demand is 200 megawatts, two years to that, you can start the construction. The previous government has done 800 megawatts per annum. So that cannot be a demand planning. But you have Valco. Please. You are, you are, I'm, I'm coming. Yeah. People are saying... Immediately, you may not have enough demand, but here you have a huge aluminum smelter which would need a lot of power. You have a lot of industrialization agendas you want to embark on which requires power. Could we not have found use for the excess supply, as you call it, for well, the power that they, they, they generated well, in what you call the take or pay agreement? Well, under such scenario, what is done in the power sector, again, is not to do negotiation, it's to undertake competition at generations, when the man can come in as an investor and construct his power plant. As a when demand is available, he supply to it. Nobody will have a problem. You don't go and negotiate when you don't have the demand. You allow competition to happen. 
when the person comes as an investor, put his own money, nobody gets, mm. gets no guarantee from government, we will allow such you know, occurrences to occur. But that was not what, what mm. happened. So this cannot be dis de described as a demand plan. It was a total failure. So the finance minister said chaos. that we had over 2,000 megawatts of power we did not need. How, what have you done with that? Because I think it was the previous budget. He said, as a result of what he called take or pay agreements that the former government has locked us into, we have over 5,000 megawatts of production capacity where exactly. our demand is actively less than 3,000. So that's excess of 2,000. Since you became energy minister, what have you done with that? Have you how many have you renegotiated, for example? Oh well, we start. We have renegotiated, for instance, the car power. We've renegotiated the Senate. We've renegotiated the uh, ASCA. Mm -hmm. uh, the early power and the Amandi are still under negotiation. Uh, what we try to do is to see how we can, you know, bring down the capacity charge. In all this negotiation we've done. We've been able to reduce charges down by about 30 percent. Several amount of uh, okay. money have been saved as a result of this uh, mm -hmm. uh, negotiation. The excess is still there. We are still not out of the excess. The excess is still there. Mm -hmm. But what do we, we decide to do and what we are doing now is to see how we create demand outside the country. So we started, you know, constructions, you know, of uh, Greco facilities. Today in Ghana, we are exporting almost about 260 megawatts. Mm -hmm. We can go beyond the 260 megawatts. Mm -hmm. But the difficulty is that power is not like just a normal commodity. Power is a derived mm -hmm. demand. It is a derived demand. So even if you have the excess, you want to export it to Ivory Coast or you want to export it to Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. the infrastructure must be available in Burkina Faso or Ivory Coast before you send it. Otherwise, you send it to the end, you know, and it causes a lot of confusion within the infrastructure system. So Greco has done quite well. You know, they try to upgrade on the facilities, and now they are doing a lot so of export to those countries. The poor deals, and I'm using your words as NPP, that the previous administration put us into, did they warrant prosecution? If you're saying that, somebody negotiated during a crisis to produce power that we did not need in excess capacity at a price which was unsustainable, locking us into a bad deal. Did you consider that to be some sort of financial loss to the state? Did well, it get to that level, or this was just bad decisions? Well, at my level, I look at the technical implications. I think those uh, legal consequences, you know, goes beyond my, you know, uh, my thinking. But of course, as you rightly put it, you know, you are paying for something that need not happen. Uh, some decisions have caused that to be done. I don't know what the legal ramifications of that will, will result to, but definitely you're paying for something that you don't demand. And this money, mm. of course, are money that we got from, you know, okay. uh, various people across this country. Just the last one. On the early power, you say you are renegotiating it. That's interesting because a year, a few months into your administration, you granted a $90 million tax waiver to the power project, early power project. So if you say you are renegotiating the early power deal, which aspect of the deal are you renegotiating? No, they are just looking at the capacity charges. Which is how That's, much? Um, I think the, the, their capacity is about 5.8, if I quite, or about 6, you know, cents per kilo at all. I don't have that record there. Your, yeah. your former organization, ASEP, has a write-up on the early power deal. And this is an, a credible organization. Yeah. It's credible, right? They say that the cost of the project is still too high. The renegotiated project, they said it was too high. We have not completed the, the, the renegotiations. As I'm telling you, the renegotiation is still ongoing as I speak today. The ones that I can say are almost done include mm. the car power, the, even the ASCA, we still have to do something about it, but we brought it down about 30%. Okay. Senate has been concluded, you know. Uh, we brought it down almost about 20 percent. So these three, I can be sure. Okay. The other ones, like the uh, Amandi and the other, the Early Power, the renegotiation is, is, is still ongoing. Okay. The NDC yeah. say they solved Dumso. You dispute that. I've heard you say that the difference between Dumso and Dumkra. What, what's the meaning of that? This is all these questions. Sometimes I I feel very. Uh, I'm quoting you. You said it. At I know. The press I know. Conference. But I'm saying they you say they said it. Yeah, I understand. I yeah. mean, if they say they solved the doom, so yeah. I don't want to answer it. But uh, Bernard, you should be honest to yourself. Uh, I, I can give you the figures. What we talked about reliability mm -hmm. and the number of hours that the power stay mm -hmm. in 2014, 2013, and 2016 mm -hmm. compared to the number of hours the power stays from 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Have you shared that with the public? These figures are there. I when? mean, anytime we, well, these figures are there. I can let you Where have a look they? at it. I mean, they are with ECG. Energy Ministry or ECG? ECG, they are, they are all, the figures are all available. Because most of the deals that 
supply the power Better. that you say we in, have in excess. In, just a second. 20, Those no, deals no, were it, signed before they left government. Let me just so if you say that, I'm coming now. The, all the deals you just referred to, ASCA, yeah. Car Power, Senate, they were all signed before they left. Yeah. And then you said, we have more power than we need. Yeah. Yet you said they didn't solve them. So mm -hmm. there's, there's some tension in that sequence. You know, you, you know, the power sector, it's not the generation issue. One of the cheapest and the easiest activity mm -hmm. any ministry responsible for power yes. can do is to ask people to come and construct power plants. Yes. All over the world. So generation, it's not a problem to address power issue mm -hmm. because you are giving an investor a return on an investment. Yes. Any good investor will do that. Today, mm -hmm. if I want to sign 1,000 megawatts of power today, Bernard, and I give you a quite a good read, everybody will do it. Good. So that is not the issue. Mm -hmm. The problem we have in Ghana was how to manage the power we have through the procurement processes, mm -hmm. which have to do with the availability of feed. Mm -hmm. You can buy 1,000 vehicles and park them in your house. Mm -hmm. You have not addressed your transportation problem. Mm -hmm. If you have vehicles parked in your house and you want to go to market without fuel in the vehicles, you cannot go to market. So the problem was not calling on generation. The problem was how to make sure that those vehicles you place in the house are able to move from one point to another point. So if the NDC comes out, sometimes when they come out say, we have done uh, 5,000 megawatts, you have done nothing. I have been in power till now for the past four years. I have not signed one single uh, PPA involving any combined circle turbine. You think it's very difficult to call investors and ask them to construct 500 megawatts power plant. It is very easy. They come and knock at my door every time. But I tell them that is not the problem we have. Mm -hmm. The problem we have, which I hope you can help me solve, is to see how you can construct a grid line from Tamale to Ivory Coast, a grid from Tamale to Burkina Faso, how to upgrade on our grid system from 161 to the 330 KVIs that we have. How do we upgrade this system? That it's what I would do, and this is exactly what we are doing. This is true. The whole infrastructure has mm. remained in its state without any mm. attempt to revamp them. So in DCG's the facilities are now being described as an obsolete facility. Fair, fair so in the four years we've been in office, what investments have you made in our transmission network? How much investment we've has... We've made a lot of uh, investment, yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, Greco. Give me amounts, uh, upgrade. like how much? Ah, it should be running, uh, I mean, about $200 million. I mean, in which specific should, aspects of our transmission? Upgrading of the transformers, for instance, the transmission lines in the uh, BA, Brona Halfo region, you know, we've done uh, high uh, grade, you know, uh, upgrade system on that. We've tried to extend uh, the grid, you know, from Tamale to the, uh, all the way to Burkina Faso, which I'm discussing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, with a Greek crew. And then they are doing that now. They are looking for a short stretch uh, to be done. ECG, just about uh, a month ago, the president under his directive has granted almost about 150 million US dollars to mm -hmm. ECG to make sure that they upgrade on their equipment, which we call the obsolete equipment. Currently, they are replacing uh, some of those uh, equipment. They are introducing what they call the V, you know, VIT systems into the, into the into the line, which makes sure that any time that there's a power, you know, problem, you mm. know, your lines, the whole stretch in parallels are not shut down, mm. but a specific area is shut down. So these are some of the, you know, upgrades that we have. While, while I don't want to re-argue the PDS deal, a lot of people feel that the way this government managed that deal cost us money. In fact, 190 million dollars or more in terms of the concession suspension because of the PDS deal termination, you concede to that? And I think government has managed it well. Really? Yeah. You see, sometimes you don't only look at money and refuse to do what is wrong or refuse to do what is right, sorry, because there is a money available, even though the process is leading to me undertaking or having received that money, it's wrong, I must still go by that process. I don't think that is genuine. That is not governance. Good governance do not necessarily look at what comes in terms of revenue. But you must also look at the procedural aspect that lead you to that activity. And I think what government but has done... But the PDS deal was your own creation. It wasn't somebody else that did it. You, you, when they, you say our own creation, uh, what do you mean? Look, PDS was not created by the opposition. I, I didn't mention opposition. Yeah, the PDS yes. was, was uh, a vehicle that the government approved of. Yeah. Under the power compact. Precisely. So either you didn't dot your I's and cross your T's properly, or you discovered something. It, it's obviously your own, it's your fault. No, in every, in every 
procurement processes, there is an index of an element that allows for due diligence. Mm. The process of a due diligence is not an event. Mm. It's never an event, you know, in a procurement processes. Mm -hmm. Process of due diligence, you know, it's an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. So it is through this process that ECG yes. detects that there is something wrong. Yes. There is nothing. If, if, if we are just saying that the due processes should be when you submit your papers and I looked at it and say go. That is not due process. But we've due process must start from completion to construction. If you are a lawyer, maybe. I'm you, not a you, lawyer yet. Well, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> PDS was suspended <laughs> around this time a year ago. U.S. Yeah. government has said by October when we should reinstate PDS, we did not. It's been a year since PDS went away. What's the state of the concession? That, that, that means it's, it's cancelled. It's cancelled. Government has cancelled it. So we've lost $190 million. We did not. That we would have gained. Well, no, no, don't look at it that way. They were going to give us 190 million. Don't the West yeah. African compact. Do, would you, would you, would you, would you understand the consequences if we had gone ahead with that? But who created PDS? No, no I'm saying that. Would you understand the consequences if we had gone with just looking at the 190 okay. million dollars? You may be chasing that 190 million dollars. Mm -hmm. There may be a default at certain processes for which you may trigger, mm -hmm. you know, the insurance. You go to the insurance running into two billion dollars and you can't get it mm. why you are chasing 190 million okay. uh, for no for no reason so please don't look at the 19 190 million let's look at the process and see how genuine the process was this is the point of view my guest is honorable john peter Mewu, minister for energy he's also the mpp parliamentary candidate for whole constituency when we come back we'll jump into his chances now the voter region is the stronghold of the ndc but peter Mewu and some mpp people think that this could be their year would we'll find out what really is going on in that region and what his chances are in Hohoe. Stay with us. As a passenger, you have a lot of power in avoiding car accidents. The National Road Safety Authority wants you to use your voice to save lives. Speak up if your driver is over speeding, drink driving, overtaking wrongfully or using their mobile phone. And if your driver is tired, please make them stop and rest. Road safety is a shared and collective responsibility. So let's look out for ourselves, protect each other and arrive alive. Thank you. See, guys. The team will do all. So give me four more. We could do more. Please be what they pour me. Four more for what? Must answer the guy. Four more for what? Four more to do more for you. Four more to store more excavators and our money. Bisabio. Or four more to kill Ghanaian businesses. No. no. Ah. Four more for family and friends. Four more for neglected projects. Four more for soccer and broken promises. Open up and now four more to borrow more with nothing to show. No way. Hello? Four more for lawlessness, intolerance, and harassment of the media and the political opponents. I beg you. You make a cry self. What happened to the murders of Ahmed Swali? What about the members of the Delta Force where they attacked the court for Kumasi? Where them also brutalized innocent citizens for our CS Wogon. Even you the one that four more. Four more for more corruption scandals, like the PDS, Australian Visa Fraud Scandal, can I say fraud scandal, then PPE, don't call me contract for sale by the incompetent clearing agent. Four more to steal more. No! no. Vote John Mahama and NDC for jobs and prosperity for all. Welcome back to The Point of View. My guest is John Peter Ameu, former Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, now Minister for Energy, also MPP parliamentary candidate for Hohoe constituency. I'm going to show you some photos because it seems as if, and you've seen this before, Mr. Peter Ameu seems to have some support. So there are some rallies he's held. Um, the crowds are large. Uh, the roads are filled of people. He's met some key influencers. We have photos of him with the national chief imam, with Rawlings. He seems to be creating a sensation within the Hawkeye constituency of the MPP. So let me show you some of those photos quickly, and then I'll ask 
where the real optimism lies. So, John Pierre, so you are <laughs> not the first MPP person. So there is the chief imam, 100, happy 101 birthday. There are a few more coming. You're not the first MPP person who's expressed optimism in the Volta region. I've heard this before. So what are your realistic chances? What are you, what, what's your hope? What are you telling the party when you talk to national organizer and general secretary and they ask you, how, how, how? What, do you what do you say to them? Well, I wish I don't talked about this. Um, uh, I, I tell them that the chances are bright. Mm -hmm. uh, I leave the final day, uh, you know, to God, mm. or the seventh of December to God, mm. and, and that's what I tell them. Um, I know uh, definitely, uh, and I'm pretty sure as I sit here, there's going to be a history to be made in Huawei. The really? People, yes, yes, Bernard. History uh, will be made in Huawei. Yes, I've done this uh, before, and uh, I know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. and. The it, it politics. Hold on, where is this? Where, where is this? I see somebody at Alabanyo for development, something, something t shirt. Uh, yes, I think this is when I was going to file, yeah. Just when to I was, file? Yes. So, yeah. who are these people? Well, they jump onto the street. Um, you I, didn't I, mobilize them? No, 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 no. I said I was going to file on Wednesday, and then my regional secretary. Uh, you know, I just left office and he came. So Wednesday, why don't we do it the following day? Mm. And I said, okay. So we left Hohe late. Uh, we left Accra late in the night and got to Hohe the following day. And all these people came to support you to file. Yeah, yeah. Are they? Yeah. What, go, wow. Yeah, this, uh, <laughs> hey. uh, yeah. Really? Uh, this is when I, I was I was doing some teaching. You know, uh, the JSS. You uh, went to uh, teach. SS. Yes. For BEC, yeah, yeah, BEC exams, you know. Uh, yeah, so what's, what's your message to the people? In the Hawaii? message to them is that politics is about development. The message to them is that when they vote on that 7 December, they are seeking to get me a job. They are asking that they will be paying my salary, they will be paying, uh, they will be giving me a car, they will be giving me a house, a cook and everything. But in return, what are they getting? So the message is that it's a very serious business. It is not an ordinary business where you want to go and just vote and go and celebrate and go home. You are getting somebody a job opportunity for that person to serve you. What do you want to get in return? Mm -hmm. And I think the people in Hawaii understand, you know, they understood this clearly, that they need to make a decision that will not be temporary. Most often in our lives, mm -hmm. in Hawaii and other parts of voter region, our decision to vote and the, the aftermath of that decision is just enjoyment for two days. When re election is done on the 7th, on the 8th and 9th, results are declared. The people celebrate on 10th and 11th. That is all. That's what they get for the four years. So what are you going to the give them? But, but, but what do they need? You are a lawmaker. You are not supposed to give them anything. No, no, that make a lawmaker. You need a negotiation power to make good laws. You need negotiation power to be able to mm. influence development. So it, it, this saying that, let's be re very realistic, it's saying that MPs are only there for, it's not true. Really? No, 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 no please. The MPs are not only for making laws. So they are there to provide they development. They are also development agents. So what development are you promising them? Oh, a lot, a lot of development. I mean, I'm promising them, you know, their career status where they are, there's going to be improvement in their life. Really? Their lifestyles will improve. People will now have job opportunities. I'm promising them every single family there will be an opportunity. So, so what family. is going on here? I see a ram in MPP colors and, uh, and some yam. You know, I think I visited one of the communities and they, they were giving me... Oh, you, I thought you were to give them, or they are now giving you... They give me a lot of things when I... They give you things, yes, they, hoping that when you come, you give them back. Not necessarily, you know. So also maybe uh, because they've seen the good job I'm doing, you know. So some they, of them they gave you yam? Yeah, that's a yam, the, the queen mother, you know. Uh, really? You know, the people from Hohoe, uh, they have a tradition, uh -huh. especially if you are a visitor mm -hmm. and you pay a visit to uh, the palace, you know, there's always this tradition that mm -hmm. they have to honor you. Mm -hmm. And I think those are some of the pictures. It's alleged you are spending a lot of money. There was a, a, a photo on social media, I'll put it up, yeah. that claims you are even paying people. It's like a scratch, a meu scratch card mm. that you are, you are here. This is it. Mm. Vote a meu for hundred Ghana fake, cities. You can see fake there. That is, that no, is everybody can put fake. But how did they put your picture there? <laughs> well, you can also see another one with the same lady. It's also on the Facebook. Which one? Uh, there's the same woman. I, I have it somewhere here. I think I saw it also. The same my my uh, competitor. She also has the same thing. 
So this, this, this are not realistic, please. Uh, you are not you, offering money for votes? How do you give money for votes? Because you I seem to have a lot you, of it. They say you have spent a lot. I mean, they, they, there's a lot of but this, claim this that you are pumping money into the election. Yeah, we, we, we're doing a lot in terms of development. Uh, under this government, you know, we're constructing roads, we're building. The, the stadium that we put in Hohe is bigger than the stadium being built in Hohe, the original stadium. I mean, state of the art stadium. We're building new you know, uh, uh, secondary schools. We, we're doing a lot of social intervention projects, water in various uh, uh, communities, youth yeah, but empowerment. You're also, they say you're also giving things to people. For example, there's a video your own team put up of you giving helmets to over 400 Okada riders. Yeah, because the Okada, it's a very dangerous business that they're doing. They're not wearing helmets. Mm. I deem it as somebody to, to protect them. I mean, as, as but you're giving 400 helmets. There's nothing wrong giving 400 helmets. How much is your salary? To buy 400, 400 helmets. Well, I have 400. Moto helmets. No, no, I don't think. The motos were, of course, donated to me, and they were given to me by <laughs> Benevolent. And so, of course, So, I actually, I want to show that video, because mm -hmm. your airway your is also pretty nice. Are you from Hohe? I'm from Bing. Be which part? Well, who will tell you that I'm a, I'm a Togolese? So. No, no, no. <laughs> no, if you say you're from, from Bla, I'm from okay, Bla. Yeah, because there's, B, yeah. you know, what words are called Bijigbe people. B, uh, yeah, we are from Bijigbe. Fantastic. Yeah, Let right. me, Precisely I want, I'm I want, from Bla. Yeah. I want you to listen to Peter Mew. And mm. I don't, when was this video? Because you were giving, you were giving the people fans, and they were giving you fans in return. Eh, yeah. show, show it. Where is that? And this is from his own campaign. Speaking yeah. nice away. <laughs> Au <laughs> The Motor Riders Association are very strong. But if you talk about development, that is why Hohe is developing. Even throughout the whole of this uh, country, the motorbike rider, America, where that <laughs> Uh, my wow. <laughs> when was this? This was, uh, I just saw well last year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> so this is the Hawkway Motor Riders Association. Yeah, this is Hawkway Motor Riders Association. About 400 of them. There are more, there are about 800. But yeah. with respect, you sounded a bit like John Mahama because y y it's funny, you said. And I, I don't know if you, you said yeah. motor riders are providing employment and essential service to people of Hawaii. Well, of course they're doing it. Exactly That's what he said. And your what? party took him on. No, it's the, it's, it's the regularization of the. the, the no, of but it. he said mm. Okada has provided more employment mm. than. Nothing. Well, maybe he picked from my ways. I, yes, well, yeah, but, so, so why are people so, attacking him then? No, well, because he said the same thing. Yeah, but I'm saying that maybe he picked from my ways in in Hawaii. That was exactly what was happening. But you see, the, the party's position is the safety. Today, you know, the, uh, the doctors will, will tell you the number of, you know, accident victims that comes to the hospital on daily basis as a result of this. Mm -hmm. The issue is, do, is there any better way to reform them? Can they even migrate from the Okada to a more portable form of a vehicle, you know, 
uh, to drive. Those are some of the promises that I keep giving them. Mm -hmm. But for the time being, how do you protect them? They are still in the business, just as the Galam say. How do you reform them? And that was why those, you know... Uh, so, no, but the argument is that your party's view now is just political because you, being a leading member of the party, clearly you support to cut business. And yet, when Mahama said he was going to legalize and then regularize, your people took him on and said he was being irresponsible. But there you are, no. hailing Okada people, telling them that they are the guys no. who are doing no, no, the no, real no, thing. No, 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 listen to me clearly. Mahama's point is that he is coming to make Okada to stay. Our party's point is that we're coming to reform the Okada to a better level. Okay? So they are two different. This MPP government currently is trying to see how through the mass lock support, People who have Okada, even in what way we've done it, people who write Okada, I, I, we help them through the mass lock, you know, facility to get a vehicle that they are mm. driving now on the street. So it is the reformation and the level at which you want to put them. But just to say you want to leave them at the position in which they are, uh, how, if you say you're going to legalize Okada, you would allow it to be as it is. It doesn't make any relevant sense to, to the so Ghanaian consumer. the people. MPP got 18.6% in Hohwe in the previous election. John Sinaso Yonkita says you're a good man, but being a good man will send you to heaven, not to parliament. Well, uh, he, he said it clearly, but uh, the people of Owen know that in heaven there are good things. <laughs> Is that not it? <laughs> if you're going to heaven, it means you are good to go to heaven. And so they know that that person, uh, you know, should go to parliament and bring the good things, you know, before he goes to heaven. Yeah, so yeah, I will so only go to heaven, not parliament. No, 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 I'll go to the, parliament. No, then, then he said it. <laughs> Is he your friend? Oh, yeah. The general is my very good friend. Well, but some people but also in the mm. recent um, Western Togoland agitations, mm. they, they, they believe that there are invisible hands promoting the agitators. And uh, there was an interview, I think there were some audios a reporter brought, that some people said you were part. I think they also mentioned the Volta Regional Minister's name that they didn't know these so-called uh, Western Togoland agitators and that people like you were behind them. No, it's false. It's false. These agitators, unfortunately, always surface up any time MPP is in government. We saw it under President Kufo, under John Mahoma, it's vanished. So the people who are behind it know themselves. Mm. For me, they say when the people were arrested, the same NDC went and said, well, I have caused the arrest of the people. Earlier, they said, I brought the people to be trained, and I brought the people to be trained, and I went and arrested them. I mean, what type of uh, uh, statements are those? So, these agitators have been there. It's, it's something that I started, you know, a uh, long time uh, but ago. But there's a view that the MPP has not dealt with that issue with the level of seriousness it requires, and somehow it plays to the party's advantage if the region is seen in that negative light. I don't think so. National security is a security that governs this country. If there's a disturbance today in Volta region, it cuts across every part of Ghana. The number of people from other parts of this region that marries from Volta region. Most of these, our Shanti good friends and brothers, all their wives are from Volta region. So why would they want to sit and have their children to face such type of cal uh, calamity? They will never do that. So I think that we need to face issues as it is. Nobody from any other part of this country who think that there should be because, a oh, distortion. There's, there's, there's like, how, what could, how could three roads be blocked, a whole police station ransacked, weapons stolen? And it, it seems as if there was some laxity no. on the part of security so, so, Some of this is the security, agencies. The, the way they act sometimes with their intelligence. Mm. When they, they went to uh, Akusomu, for instance, to uh, that Akuse, mm -hmm. you know, to bend the ties and attempted to cause damages, yeah. I went and saw the... Uh, 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 the pictures and then the video. Mm. I was asking the, the security, ah, but why didn't you arrest these people? Because I was talking from a layman's point of view. Because you can see the people carrying and then they were walking around. Then this security man came and, you know, tried to comfort them, talk to them nicely. I said, ah, you should have, you know. And the guy was telling me that what they were carrying alone, he doesn't, number one, know what is inside. And any attempt to cause mm. any distraction there, if he's having something, he can blow the whole down. And that is why they acted in that kind of way and allowed them to leave. So sometimes the security intelligence and the, 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 the way they act, you and I may not understand. You know, especially in the era of mm. this electioneering period, mm. you know, if those securities have shot those guys, you know, at the mm. uh, Akuse.
they were coming close to the... the, the, the people were able to hoist a flag at the Regional Coordinating Council, which is the, <laughs> I mean, the, the headquarters. Men, yeah. Imagine, could, can somebody go to Flagstaff House and go and put up another country's flag there? And no security will see it. it and when they woke up the next morning, they saw a Western Togoland flag at RCC. It depends if you have a security there that it's somehow uh, affiliated or mm. have some sympathy to them. How would you know? That security can do it. So maybe the person who planned that regional coordination council could be around. You see, some of these things, you don't just have to look at it as a stand, but we need to take uh. our time and then evaluate you know, the issues carefully. I see. The, the voter region people have not also been happy, particularly the NDC, with the deployment of military people during the voter registration exercise. There was a whole lot of conversation about attempts to disenfranchise voterians. Being a voterian in the MPP, how do you deal with that kind of issue where militaries were not deployed in voter region? No. Militaries were deployed throughout Ghana. So that, that includes water region? Yes, so it's not like... But, just it, well, the, but the water region people complain about it. Yeah, what about the other regions that share border with Togo? Well, when, our, not, when, our, just, when, our, when our correspondent went to the yeah, Georgian because code, the people said there was an undue deployment of soldiers around where they were voting, and they felt intimidated. Military people were deployed around the western region that is also close to Ivory Coast. But the military if people you have to a role to play in voter registration? Please... The deployment of the military was not as a result of the voter registration exercise. The militaries were deployed during the COVID-19 pandemic regime, when borders were then closed and people were trying to migrate from one end to another. We all know, you know, what this COVID had brought to this country. That was mm. when these military were deployed. At, you know, during the process of this uh, 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 Western Togo, mm -hmm. uh, Bruha, of course, militaries, again, were deployed. But the militaries were initially deployed not because of Volta region. They were sent there for other reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then they were deployed across the whole... What I want us to understand clearly is that let us not just select Volta region out of what was at that time happening across the country. Because other parts of the country were also included. People but, say but you the are people from the, the Volta, Volta region were the ones who complained. So if other people are happy with it, the president Precisely, they have a right to complain because... So my question is to you, being a leading member of the party, being from the region, is that not uh, an undue intimidation? Not at all. That is why we went there and explained to the chiefs, because they do not understand that this thing was across the whole of the country. Myself, the national security, and other high you know, government officials went there, and we do explain to them, and I think they understand it. And some of them even think that it's the safety, you mm -hmm. know, of the region that is more important because their safety, it's a concern to government. But how do, you, how do you get people to trust you on this when MPP has said many times that, for example, Ketu South has too many voters. They said there's a bloating in our voters register and voter region and duly has large numbers and they allow Togolese to come and vote. These are things people in your party have said. Yeah. So if then you have a deployment of military people during the voter registration period... They may, mis they may misunderstand the, the, the rationale for that. And that is why it is important that you explain to them. And that was exactly what we did. You asked a very good question. The people might not really understand the essence of that, but it takes government and effort to go and explain Explain to them. Let's end with oil sector. We've spoken about power enough. There's a, uh, COVID appears to have affected our ability to produce within the past six or so months. And it seems to be something that hasn't gotten a lot of news coverage. How confident are you that the plans and projections you've made for that sector will be delivered within the period? The COVID pandemic has globally affected the explorations, productions, and decommissioning of the uh, fossil fuel industry. Uh, it's also a fact that global fund these days, uh, because of some restriction in terms of uh, some environmentalist mm -hmm. uh, exploration activities has reduced dramatically across, you know, uh, the globe. And the coming of this uh, COVID, of course, have serious uh, consequences. Something that we are going of the era of oil, but mm -hmm. I sincerely believe that may not be the case. So, yes, it's true. Uh, to ramp up to where we were, it's going to be very difficult because the demand now uh, for global consumption, you realize the growth of China, India, uh, which are one of the ma major consumers, it's not as high as it used mm. to be. The U.S. economy, it's, it's, it's not as ramp uh, very 
uh, vibrant. vibrant, you know, as we saw in uh, 2017, you know, in the later part of beginning of 2018. So uh, we will not be witnessing exploration activities for the coming years. Mm. I know the one sector works such that if your ratio uh, of uh, uh, depletion, you know, to exploration, if it is not increasing, in terms of adding new worlds as and when you deplete your results, mm -hmm. uh, of course, then definitely you're going to have a difficulty ahead. And so what is happening now is that because Global Fund is not there to undertake further exploration activities, we expect that these activities that are already ongoing, mm -hmm. production will gradually ramp up for which maybe in the next three to four years, mm -hmm. you know, demand will begin to climb again. There's so a we need a short time now. We'll have a, we'll but have, we'll a have a challenge of people investing because nobody wants to invest when yeah. you're not my, going my, to my, 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 my point to you is that this may not just be in a short term. Let me read a quick story for you. Doche Kobla Club or two writes that 500 workers to lose jobs after cancellation of oil and gas contracts. And it says 98 upstream oil and gas contracts valued at $389 million have been cancelled mm. due to COVID-19. Contracts awarded by ECA. AGM, ENI, Gosco, and Springfield between the fourth quarter of last year and the first quarter of this year were affected as a result. A minimum of 500 Ghanaians will lose their jobs. They've uh, not been cancelled, but they've been postponed. We defer the, you know, most of those contracts have uh, deferred their, you know, development period because of the COVID. But uh, they have not been cancelled. Egbert ever. Fable, who said, I'm quoting Egbert Fable, yeah. so uh, he's your, I mean, he reports to you, but mm. the cancellation of these contracts, such as 5 year MS drilling contract, which was terminated in June 2020, together with associated subcontracts, will have a devastating toll on local businesses. So that the. Well, those are the service, those are the service, you know, the exploration industry works yes. like that. There's a lot of service contracts. Yes. And so where the exploration activity is served or the development activity is served is deferred, mm -hmm. of course, you expect the uh, subcontractors that work within, you know, to, to be standstill. Mm -hmm. So some of those uh, subcontractors' contracts have been deferred, you mm -hmm. know, as you rightly put it. Yeah. So that's, that's, my, that's my point. So the, the outlook for that sector, because most of the drilling companies are not Ghanaian. The benefit we get is the subcontracts, which right. are our people. If you have about six of these contracts cancelled, 500 Ghanaians are going to lose their jobs. Yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty serious. It's gloomy. I mean, the, the, the picture doesn't show any good there. Uh, and it's, it's not Ghana alone. It's not and just specific speaking, to Ghana. Kofi Annan, uh, International Peace Minister, says pirates are marauding the West African coastline, further endangering the people who are even doing exploration at all. So it, it's a very dark situation mm. for the oil sector. The pirating issue is right. It's also because there are a lot of tankers that are standing offshore waiting for, you know, uh, uh, tanker to tanker delivery processes, which is not happening because, you know, of the, of the demand. So the industry, as you rightly put it, it's, and it, this is a time again that the European Union and another uh, uh, mm. uh, developed countries, you know, are calling for more cleaner, yeah. you know, fuel. Yeah. So uh, there's, we, there's, there's consequences for... Uh, you are not a road minister, but let me yeah. end with this one. The last time I visited your constituency, I was on my way to Jasikan Aka area. And usually I would have used the Hohwe road, but I could not. I had to use Bando, mm. go and pass through some other side mm. and ended up there. Eastern Corridor Road, what's your... Co what's your commitment? This was about how many years when you traveled on that road? Oh, it was last year. Last year, okay. There's progress on that road, tremendous progress. Really? I'm telling you, yeah. Which, which, as which part? Because there was a there's section from uh, Hawkeye to Jessica. I was told if, if I try, I'll be in trouble. So Hawkeye to Jessica. Now, if you, if you try, you, try. You, you do it in 20 minutes. It used to be two hours. It's been done. Yeah, you can do it now in 20, 25 minutes. Really? Yeah. Tiring, when you know, was it done? They've done the first seal. They've done the second seal. Mm. The lower part getting close to Hawkeye. The sub base has been done. They've mm. done the base. Mm. You know. The drains are oiled in place. So you can now do that 25 to 30 minutes I now. See. It used to be two hours. That has been done. Mm. Uh, the section from Harvey mm -hmm. uh, uh, down to uh, Bajeme, uh, what do you call it, Gagbepe, and mm -hmm. those areas, mm -hmm. contractors are on that route. Seven contractors are currently working what on the Eastern Corridor. From Ajokwe to Pebe? From Ajokwe to. That's so Piki, yeah, Asikuma, Piki, Piki Ajokwe that, to that Pebe. Section, that section is given to First Kai. You know, you can see that even the asphalt quality of that, that whole yeah, section has really? gone bad already. No, yeah, yeah. The, the last time I went it's, there, it's like bad. two months ago, there yeah. were so many portals yeah. on that so, road. So a new contractor is, 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 is put on that road. So 
uh, these three years, the number of kilometers that have been done on the Eastern Corridor, I'm not a road minister, as you are right, but the road minister will tell you that it far exceeds the number of kilometers that were done in the eight years of the past administration. Three years. And these are facts that, you know, people can go and verify that within three years, what is the mileage constructed and completed by His Excellency Nana Adodanku Akufuado on the Eastern Corridor? Measure it. It's, you can just drive and set your speedometer or whatever it is mm. to measure it. Mm. Then you go back and measure what John Muhammad has done in eight years on the Eastern Corridor. Then we can conclude really? who is constructing the Eastern Corridor. We, we can check that. We'll take a short break. I mean, the somebody must do that exercise for me. It's very easy. Three years work done on Eastern Corridor mm. by the current administration compared to work done on the Eastern Corridor eight years by the previous administration. That gives us the length. You can see that we've done not less than 70% more than what they have done. The only section they constructed on the Eastern Corridor was the section from Asikuma Junction to that Peki stretch. And that asphalt, that is the first time in my life I have seen asphalt failing within a year. This is still the point of view. We're talking to Minister for Energy, John Peter Meu, who's also the MPP's candidate for Howard constituency. Stay with us. protection from sweat and bacteria for a deep clean feeling that lasts new Nivea men deep antiperspirant Nivea men it starts with you official sponsor of Real Madrid <laughs> Welcome back. This is still the point of view. We're talking to John Peter Meu, who's the Minister for Energy, and he's also the NPP candidate for Hawkway constituency. He's confident he would win. He says his government has delivered. Somebody, somebody wants you to ask you, what? four more for what? You say four more for Nana. To come and do what? To come and complete what he has started and what he's doing. You've all seen, like I'm telling you, even within the three years, a lot more has been done on the Eastern Corridor. We want to complete the whole of the Eastern Corridor. Mm. So let's give him another four more years to yeah. complete it. For the eight years, that had not been done. So give him another four more years to do it. That's all the But if, if he's done more in three years than John Muhammad did in eight years, he doesn't need four more to finish the Eastern Corridor. <laughs> if he's done that much well, on everybody, the Eastern Corridor. Of course. But so so that, that is what you are saying. So what it means no, is I'm, that I'm using your argument. No, no, no. I, I'm not, I'm but, but you go one more. You can't see because I have more. I, I know, we haven't fact checked that point yeah. you've said. You've yeah. said, you said, Mr., uh, your, your government has done more in three years on the Eastern Corridor than the past eight years. Precisely. Go and measure the length. <laughs> it's not how we we'll check. No, no, go and measure the length. This we, one, go, we, measure, we have the Eastern Corridor from, As, uh, from right. Asikuma all the way to Boku. The Eastern Corridor actually started Oti. from Ashama Runabout. Yes. And you've done more. We have done more work on the Eastern Corridor within the three years. Okay. Or four when years. More, more kilometers or more, more work? Yeah, of course, it's a road. So it's how, a length. How, what kilometer? What length? I don't have, but I, 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 I can't measure the well, whole. I'm not the, the one who makes the amendment must have proof. Eh? No, no, that's what I'm asking you. That you go, <laughs> well, I drive on that road. I see it myself. I see. For instance, from Hogwarts to Jessica alone, yes. the from Hogwarts to Jessica, it exceeds the whole mileage that they've done on Peki Stretch. But that's not all they did. They did all the way to from where? Dodi Pepezu to Nkwanza. Dodi Pepezu, where is Dodi to Nkwanza? Otidamanko. That is not the, that's it's not the Eastern Corridor Road. Well, I'm talking about the main Eastern Corridor Road through Hogwarts, going through Nkwanza, going to Pasa. That is the major eastern corridor. I see. The other one takes you to Oti, then by Pando. I'm talking of the main eastern corridor. Even currently, we, under this government, there is a work going on on that, the other stretch of the eastern corridor. Thank you. We wish you well in your campaign. We'll talk to you again soon. 
John Peter Mewu is the Minister for Energy and is also the NPP's candidate for Howard constituency. Thank you for watching tonight's edition of The Point of View. We'll be with you next time. Bye-bye. The Point of View is powered by Airtel Tigo. Have you heard that Airtel Tigo calls from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. and Airtel Tigo money transfers are now free on new sims? Now you know. Airtel Tigo.